Okay, hopefully this is all going to plan and you can see us and hear us all. Uh, welcome to uh, Surveillance Isn't Safety, uh, International Tech Policy Trends on, in Online Safety. Um, we're so thrilled to have you here. Um, so before I go anywhere, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm tuning in today from the stolen lands of the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation. So for those who are tuning in from uh, elsewhere around the world and may not be aware, so-called Australia was built on the stolen lands of hundreds of unique Indigenous nations and sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, Digital Rights Watch, which is the organisation that I work for, um, does a lot of work around fighting surveillance and other harmful applications of technology, which, you know, as tools of policing and control, do disproportionately um, impact and are disproportionately weaponized against First Nations peoples uh, in the colony of Australia, which is something that I think is really important for us to keep in mind in conversations like this. Um, I also want to highlight that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples developed really sophisticated systems of governance, accountability, and knowledge sharing that didn't rely on ubiquitous surveillance. And this, I think, serves a as a really important reminder that the colonial and carceral systems that we live under are not natural or normal or necessary. So I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that uh, we are on today around Australia and pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, and also acknowledge that this is not just an issue that happens here, but happens around, around the world. Uh, so if you're in the chat and you want to put in the traditional lands that you're on and acknowledge where you're coming from. I would love that. Um, and uh, yeah, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So today we are gathering to talk about international tech policy trends under the banner of online safety. So as you can gather from the title of this session, we're coming from a standpoint that surveillance isn't safety. Unfortunately, this you know, continues to appear to be, to, to dominate the thinking around safety, both online and offline, but you know, does, it, does it need to be that way, I guess is where we're coming from today. Before we go too much further, I will introduce myself properly. Uh, my name is Samantha Floriani. I'm the program lead at Digital Rights Watch here in Australia. Uh, Digital Rights Watch is a not-for-profit civil society organization, um, and we work to defend human rights in the digital age. Uh, we are hosting this session today in partnership with Assembly 4. Uh, so Assembly 4 is a collective of sex workers and technologists who build products and services to empower sex workers. Assembly 4 has done some really amazing pioneering work in this space and has so much to contribute, uh, especially to this, the conceptualization of safety in online spaces, especially for the sex worker community who is you know, unfortunately still so often made unsafe by stigma and discrimination. So now I will introduce our wonderful speakers who I'm so grateful have uh, generously offered their time to join me today. Um, so first up we have Eliza Sorensen who uh, is a queer disabled query hacker, a freedom of information enthusiast, sex worker, advisor and co-founder of Assembly4, uh, which I mentioned just before as a collective of sex workers and technologists. Uh, Eliza has written and spoken about state-sanctioned violence of marginalized communities through the increase of online censorship and surveillance as a result of attempting to regulate the internet. And so for some context, uh, Eliza and I um, have both done quite a bit of work together um, in the space of online safety in Australia, pushing back on some of the uh, more harmful approaches, which we'll get into later in this session. Next up, we have Heather Burns, who is a digital rights advocate in Glasgow, Scotland. She focuses on the future of the rights to privacy and freedom of expression in the UK's current political context. She has been dealing with the UK's draft online safety bill for over three years, uh, both in previous professional capacities, uh, including the digital rights organization, Open Rights Group, as well as in her current professional capacity as the head of policy and governance at, at Scottish, tech, whoops, Scottish tech startup, that's a tongue twister, uh, Made Safe. Uh, we also have Dita Katarani, who is a feminist activist who has been deeply involved in the social justice movement in Indonesia for many years. 
Using technology and also within the technology ecosystem, she's dedicated the past decade of her life to addressing issues of human rights, gender, and technology to overcome sexist, patriarchal, and discriminatory practices and deconstruct social and institutional barriers. Dita has co-founded a number of collectives and initiatives, including Purple Code Collective, which is a community that works on issues of gender, uh, human rights, and technology in Jakarta. And finally, we have Ruth Smith, who is the Chief Executive of Index on Censorship, which is an international campaign to protect and promote free speech around the world, which was originally launched in 1971 to provide a platform for Soviet distance to expose what was happening behind the Iron Curtain. Ruth was previously the Labor MP for Stoke-on-Trent North and Kidsgrove from 2015 to 2019. And during that time, she was the vice chair of the Parliamentary Labor Party and the parliamentary chair of the Jewish Labor Movement. Uh, before her election, Ruth ran Hope, Hope Not Hate, the anti-extremism campaign, which defeated B the BNP and EDL. What's the BNP and EDL? <laughs> I just realized I didn't. <laughs> um... They're the neo-fascist parties in the UK. Okay, that's good. That's good context. <laughs> um, Ruth, Ruth has also worked in the trade union, um, a third sector and private sectors before seeking election. So welcome to all of you. It's such a wonderful panel with, you know, uh, varying expertise and insights to share on this very sort of juicy topic. There's a lot to get into. So... For some context of the conversation we're having today, uh, online safety is a really complex and highly politicized area in, uh, in tech policy. Um, harm reduction on digital platforms is essential for all of us, for you know, anyone who is uh, existing in, in this uh, online world. Um, and yet there's a really great risk of exacerbating harm if the balance isn't right. So without getting, giving too much away about where we're going with this conversation, some of the policy areas that fall under this banner are issues around content moderation and censorship, age verification, end-to-end -end encryption, and anonymity online. So today's session is all about taking stock of some of the developments in this space around the world and getting a sense of some of the common threads, you know, where we might be able to learn from each other and how we might be able to work together to, to uphold digital rights uh, internationally. So to get things going, I'm going to invite each speaker to give a short overview of the current state of play uh, in uh, online safety in their respective locations and their fields of expertise. And then we'll jump into a bit of an informal discussion. For people who are in the chat, please feel free to contribute. You can contribute questions, of course, but we would also love uh, to know what, what kind of tech policy you're seeing in your respective locations. It would be really great to get a sense of the other things that are popping up or if there are similarities or differences. So please do uh, jump in. So to get started, I would love to invite Ruth to kick us off. How are, how are things going in online safety in your, in your world? Oh, I really wish we didn't have to talk about it is where I <laughs> start from. Um, if I just give a little bit of an overview of why it's relevant for Index and, uh, and my own personal story and why, um, why some people are confused as to my position on this. So Index on Censorship, um, we have uh, correspondence, we publish a quarterly magazine we have for the last uh, 50 years. We have correspondents that live in under repressive regimes around the world. We are incredibly dependent on the internet, on end-to-end -end encryption, on online anonymity to both protect our journalists, but also sources and to ensure that the truth about what's happening in their country can get back in country. So from our perspective, the structures around online safety and around online censorship are incredibly important for us. Um, there's also huge concern from my perspective about when democracies um, use such strident language as they do um, on this debate and how it is then lifted by more repressive leaders, even those that consider themselves to be um, democratic leaders. We've seen what Modi has done in India to Twitter. We've seen um, how Erdogan, you know, I'm talking about in theory democracies at this point, but you know, the, um, how Orban also is manipulating some of the language that's coming from the UK, from the European Union, from Australia, from Canada. Um, so this is why it's important for Index. In terms of my own personal story and association with this, I, 
as you said, I was a Jewish member of parliament, parliamentarian in the UK. And my first death threats arrived online in 2014 and then got progressively worse as a high profile Jew in the UK. And I've seen several people prosecuted and my life changed beyond all recognition because of the abuse that I faced online. So in theory, I, of course, I should, yeah, there, and there have been days, let's be honest, for all of us, and especially for women. And by the way, I can't say how wonderful it is to be on an all-female panel when we're talking about digital stuff, because that never happens. So I'm, yeah, that is empowering in itself. But from my perspective, there, have, there were days when I just wanted to turn the internet off. Um, but the whole approach towards this space typically is coming from straight white men who are telling me that my that, um, my experience is that they're going to fix it for me. Um, and it's basically the online uh, space is going to become a really lovely, happy place. Um, and that is the approach that is being taken in the UK. Um, the online safety bill is a complete misnomer because actually what they want to do is delete as much content as possible. Um, and I will be less safe because I won't know when someone's put up a death threat or has, is abusing me or is stalking me online because it's likely to be automatically deleted. And I will then be vulnerable in my real life because I won't know that I have been, that someone's made a threat against me in my offline life because there is no digital evidence locker, which is one of my biggest personal gripes with the legislation. There's also this concept, this new concept of legal but harmful speech that's being used in the UK. Um, basically, can we make the platforms a space for dancing cats and um, everything else will be deleted? And for me, while it is based in good intention, the unintended consequences of the implementation of a phrase called legal but harmful is horrifying. So they want to protect and they want to remove um, incitement to suicide as a concept. Now, I can completely understand that. But if I am on a women's forum, which in the UK would be mum's net, and I have got postnatal depression, and I'm talking about my own experiences, and other mothers are coming and contribute to talk about how they felt the same, that they come through it, they've come through it, that language could be deleted under this proposal in the UK. And it will be, as ever, women and minority communities that are going to be um, silenced. And if they're not silenced because their content is going to be deleted, then it's going to be, uh, then the reach of that content is going to be limited. So we will see those who already have significant power, their voices being amplified, and those people who actually need this space, their voices being quashed, never mind the impact of pushing extremism onto the fringes and we won't know actually how people are being radicalised. There's also, um, Heather is going to talk much better about the bill than I am, because this is definitely her space. Um, but as ever, as an ex-politician, I can definitely do the, uh, the general spiel about the top lines of it. Um, but the other thing is it's complete overreach. So 24,000 platforms in the UK are going to be touched by this legislation. Actually, as ever, politicians are legislating for the work of the, um, for the platforms that they've heard of. So this is legislation for the big tech platforms. The, the impact on the smaller platforms and making sure that there is actually a market in competition that actually could drive change is missing from this. And the other part is because content is automatically going to be deleted, there won't, we won't be delivering any cultural change whatsoever because it's not about users, it's about platforms. And it, from my perspective, and as someone who's been on, as many of us would have been, on the other side of this, I want people to go on a journey. I want people to know what they've done is wrong, but also to have conversations about it and learn and develop. And their content is just going to be deleted and the platforms will, will be responsible for what they say. That is not the space that we've ever been in in the UK. So that's sort of the start of the 10 from what's happening in the UK. And that's before we talk about the Digital Services Act in the European Union. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you for that overview. There's heaps to dig into that. Sorry, I have my cat here just like attacking my notebook. Um, <laughs> so that's really interesting. So I, I'll get Eliza to jump in next, but before I do, I'll give a little bit of an overview of the our 
sort of, I guess, counterpart to that legislation, the Online Safety Act, which passed late last year and came into effect early uh, this year. Um, so there was quite a lot of controversy around this um, particular piece of legislation in Australia. Um, one of the issues as well was that the, the entire process of passing this piece of legislation, there was not any sort of particularly um, robust consultation with people um, and with particular you know community groups who are going to be particularly affected and a lot of the sort of public backlash was ignored or, or dismissed um, and then the, the bill itself was passed very quickly without um, without taking that sort of feedback into account from both civil society and community groups but also from the, the technology sector. Um, the Online Safety Act essentially what it does is so here in Australia we have an e-safety commissioner which Australia is very proud to to um, you know talk about the, as being like world leading and one of you know the first e-safety commissioner and blah blah blah. Um, Australia loves to claim to be world leading in things um, without necessarily in my opinion at least um, doing a whole lot of thinking about whether or not we're leading the world in a, in a, in a, in a good direction or not. Um, uh, some of just some truly terrible ideas coming out of this country. Um, so the Online Safety Act gives the eSafety Commissioner, who is an unelected official, um, additional powers to be able to uh, uh, issue takedown orders on particular content. So it's based on our national classification system, which is extremely outdated um, and has some very sort of like um, uh, moralistic ideas about what is and isn't harmful, which of course has all kinds of flow on effects for, um, you know, people who may not fall under the sort of status quo. So we're talking like sex workers and other people who work in the adult industry, anyone who's in the LGBTQ industry, um, industry community, even it's not, <laughs> it's not an industry. Um, so anyone who sort of falls outside of what is like accepted to be moral and decent is kind of swept up in, in this idea of harmful content. Um, there aren't many sort of checks on this power. The, the powers are, are defined really, really broadly. Um, and as you uh, mentioned, Ruth, um, one of the issues here as well is that it's kind of um, been written in a way that is designed for big tech platforms and puts um, smaller technology companies into a really tricky position to be able to meet any of these requirements, which I think Eliza will tell us more about. Um, it also includes an abhorrent violent material scheme, um, which, uh, you know, in theory is supposed to take down, you know, really awful, you know, videos of, of terrorist um, things and, and whatnot. But the trouble is, is there just aren't enough safeguards to prevent it from being possibly abused. And, um, you know, there are some circumstances where we need to see human rights abuses and things like that so we can hold people in power uh, accountable and so there just there aren't enough safeguards in place to prevent it from, from being misused and there's been a lot of discussion uh here about uh, you know the e-safety commissioner is a good person you know she would never do that she would never abuse that power but of course I mean, regardless of your opinion on that particular person, somebody else can take that role in the future and there's no guarantee that it won't be abused um, down the track. So that's a little overview, but Eliza, you, your turn, tell us a little bit from your perspective about what's happening here in Australia. So um, thank you, Sam and Ruth, that I feel like together that is such a great explanation of the online safety bills and acts that are just kind of trickling its way through the Commonwealth um, and other countries. Um, from our perspective and uh, Assembly 4's um, stance on, I guess, the Online Safety Act within Australia is that the bill itself, or the act itself is quite harmful, but also the people within e-safety at the moment, as there is no real metrics for success or failure. Um, we, uh, Assembly 4, were running a social network for sex workers called Twitter. Um, we made the very difficult decision to close it down earlier this year because we could not viably um, afford to keep running that platform, despite the fact that sex workers are being kicked off platforms left, right and centre, which not only impacts our ability to find peers and share information and knowledge, um, but organise. And with that, we're also being shadow banned off um, certain platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, if we can keep our accounts. 
um, which also has a financial impact for a lot of people, particularly during the pandemic, um, where a lot of sex workers have had to move to online work. Um, from a queer perspective, it is terrifying to see people being put into positions like the e-safety commissioner who are then platforming legitimate hate groups that want to see people like me dead. Um, I can't explain the fear of knowing that these other people who are deciding policies but also have access to um, delegated legislation which doesn't have as much scrutiny. Um, yeah, I think that's probably about the most depressing I can get about it. It is certainly an extremely depressing and scary situation. I thank you for sharing. Um, Dita, would love to hear. Would love to hear from you. We're focused a bit on Australia and, and the UK so far. Um, will you share with us your perspective and, and how things are going in Indonesia? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so I think I I, I just want to start with um, asking you to remember what we think about technology back then, right? And then compare it with the technology that we have today. It is really, it's not what we thought it would be back then. We were thinking about technology as a new way of us to express ourselves, to voice, uh, to also voice dissent, right? Back then, when, you know, technology is not as, um, um, you know, being controlled and reg regulated as it is today. We were thinking about this, you know, it, the internet could be a, you know, a new open and demo democratic uh, spaces where power can be decentralized. But what we see today, it's just completely different. And that decentralized power is now in the hand of the big tech companies that create all of these digital platforms that we use today. And they also um, create their own regulations and mechanism that really don't put the safety of, of, um, of us or of its user, especially those uh, of more uh, vulnerable ones into their considerations, yeah? Because I think Samantha also mentioned it, oh, one of you mentioned it, I'm so sorry, um, that although a lot of people think that technology is neutral, but it's actually not. Technology is very much gender gendered. It is built and developed by human beings with their own biases. And the fact that all the technology that, this, that we have now are mostly being developed by white men from the North, um, in the global North countries with their biases. And of course, they don't think about, you know, the interest and also the safety of women, LGBTIQ and other um, oppressed identities, right? Um, but the other also, the you know, but the power is also now being more and more centralized in the hand of the government, who are more and more controlling and regulating the digital spaces that we now live in without, but not, you know, but that control and regulation is actually not addressing the real problems. I mean, we've seen trends of digital threats in all parts of the world, hate speech, including those that incite violence, fake news, misinformation, um, disinformation, personal data being illegally used and leaked, digital attacks being a new tactic uh, used by the government to, op to oppress civil society. And we also see um, you know, the rise of um, OGBV cases or online gender-based violence cases against women and LGBTIQ communities. So, but with all of those uh, digital threats, even government, um, probably only a few already have, but it's still, um, you know, even, um, it, again, it doesn't really address the real problem. So, but most government doesn't really take any measure to ensure, to ensure the safety of, of, of its citizens, right? Though people like us, you know, um, you know activists of civil society, general people have been pushing both the government and big tech companies 
uh, also to uh, also advocating for regulations, but they never really listened. You know, the only measures that um, at least my government in Indonesia, but it also in other parts of um, um, the region in Southeast Asia, you know, they come up with solutions, but I think it's also like some of you already said, it's based on, you know, um, most of it based on censorship. But the censorship itself is always around, you know, um, based on, uh, around, you know, um, what morality, right? That controls especially women's body and women's sexuality. Yeah, and that is what we also see. This trend also happened uh, within the tech uh, communities or tech, sorry, tech industry, where all of these platform have regulation mechanism, and they also even build the technology to do a censorship. But what they call as a you know a single standard censorship, by looking at they said that they are going to take down the harm, harmful contents, but then we need to be really critical about what they call um, you know as harmful content because there is a real harm but then there's also an imagined harms but what the government and the platforms now or the big tech companies now they don't really distinguish that the real harm and the the um, you know the imagined harm and a lot of time the real harm for example OGBV are not being handled correctly or you know in a timely manner but a lot of them you know focus on dealing with uh, you know imagined harm such as for example you know what they call as pornography content while it is not always pornography it is a lot of time it is you know like um sexual expression for example from women and and lgbtiq um, persons so so that is actually we are what happened in indonesia and maybe i can also talk about uh, you know the regulations that we have uh, later on because i have taken quite some times beautiful yeah no i would love to hear a little bit more about about the regulation um as we move forward and i think that yeah your your point about real versus imagined harm is so pertinent and definitely can relate to that in australia there is really and i mean i would question as well like that in australia at least there's a real there's a real fixation on pornography at the moment we're having a very heated debate around um age verification for access to pornography or, or other uh you know harmful material as they will call it um and there's which often is so much based on uh not not so much based on any kind of evidence but based on you know sort of ideas uh, ideological ideas about morality and decency um, which has been really very challenging and quite harmful to 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 watch unfurl. Um, but yeah, so I, I really like that point about real versus imagined harm. That's a very it's really good. Um, Heather, tell us. I am humbled to follow three such powerful stories. I'm I'm almost lost for words here, but I'm going to do my best. Um, as as these wonderful speakers have said, with the UK and the Australian context, we're both living in countries, all of us are living in countries where the approach to online harms and online safety is very highly politicized and it's very highly political. It's not starting from a perspective of, of how do we fix online harms? How do we mitigate these problems? It's starting from a perspective of how do we make things look the way we want them to look from a, a distinctly political and ideological perspective. And um, for example, with the context of the UK's online harms, online safety bill, which, which Ruth has been working on, I've been working on this for three years. My God, it's taken up three years of my life. And it was very interesting to work on it in my previous capacity, which was a, a digital rights organization working in the civil society context about learning how this approach to online safety isn't necessarily hitting where it needs to hit, which is big tech and business models, because that is where the vast majority of these issues arise. And that's not to say they don't arise on smaller platforms, but we 
both of our, our political contexts very much have legislators who think the internet is three or four companies all based in America and are trying to legislate around that. We had some really promising moves a couple of years ago with the UK's Competitions and Markets Authority, which is the antitrust regulator, who began looking at these problems from the perspective of the business models, the underlying ad tech, the algorithmic promotion that could address these harms where they occur at scale in the most effective manner. And instead of further supporting that work or even turning uh, that particular watchdog's findings into legislation, the UK has moved, as Ruth said, towards a politicized and political system of speech and behavioral regulation through its online safety bill. And what we are looking at now, it's still in draft, it's got a long ways to go, but this conception of online safety involves what are essentially two extra layers onto your internet experience in the UK. The first will be mandatory age verification because the official tagline for the online safety bill is to make the UK the safest place in the world to be online and the safest place to grow up and be a child. Now, whatever does that mean? How do you quantify that? Um, and their, their idea is that every site or service that any British child could potentially access, no matter how innocuous, no matter, uh, if there's nothing on there that could be remotely threatening to a child, must find some way to verify or assess the age of all of its users. And that's not being done because there's necessarily any harmful content on it. That's being done as part of the compliance obligation. And it's almost clever the way they've done that. They're not saying you have to protect children from harmful content. They're saying it's a business compliance obligation. And once you've cleared that layer of age verifying every single one of your site visitors, even if they just want to read your blog or whatever, you then get into the, the UK's desire to uh, make the UK the safest place in the world to be online through the use of content moderation and behavior moderation, which is basically forms of electronic monitoring. And oh my, what a surprise, but the UK government has been spending the past couple of years investing heavily in supporting those sectors that are going to spy on all our conversations and verify all our ages and all our identities and police all of our tones and monitor who we're talking to and all that. Um, and it's very interesting. I, I really respect, Samantha, that at the beginning of this talk, you talked about colonialism. Because there have been times over these past three years where that's been what this is starting to feel like to me, that you have some politically motivated grandees sitting far, far away um, in their gilded palaces in Whitehall who have decided that the rest of us out here were all lawless savages uh, working on the Wild West Internet. I hate that quote so much, as some of you know, and that we all need to be monitored and supervised and kept in line through these sort of who are you? Who are you talking to? What are you saying? Who are you saying it to? What are you saying it? And to not just portray this as a positive, but to openly seek to um, support the companies who will do this surveillance and monitoring as a great British tech success story has been a very difficult thing to stomach. And as Ruth hinted, that's not even getting into the comparison with what these companies will be required to do to comply with DSA in Europe. Now, for me personally, it's been really, really interesting to go from having worked on these, these philosophical issues from the digital rights perspective to my current role where I work now, which is in a, a the private sector, the tech sector, where we're now looking at this bill from the perspective of what will we need to do to comply. Now, we are a privacy and freedom of expression focused company. That is what we do. We're the good guys. And we want to put a good product into the world. And we have no idea what's going to be expected of us. Because if you look at the bill as it's been drafted, the compliance obligations involve a lot of paperwork. This thing makes, you know, uh, I'm a fan of privacy regulation when it's done well. Um, this thing makes GDPR look like a practice. Um, by our count, and we're still trying to wrap, I've been working on this for three years, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. There's at least 24 different compliance assessments and obligations and tick boxes, any one of which we fail and we can be held not just 
liable for as a company. But our directors, our management, could be held criminally liable for any one of these things. And I made a joke early on in this process. Um, it, was, it was a meme joke where I said, you can't have online harms if you don't have online services. And some days that is what it's starting to feel like, that the UK wants to make it so difficult, so onerous, so expensive in terms of the mandatory compliance, so risky with the personal consequences that could fall onto you personally if someone misuses your service, that the idea is that, no, you can't start a business. No, you can't say that thing you wanted to say. So I've often said that if you try to regulate the internet as if only Facebook and Twitter and Google exist, the result will be that only Facebook and Google and Twitter exist. And it's really starting to look, you know, you, you can't escape the conclusion that that's not just the overt goal here to just consolidate a handful of tightly controlled companies, but to make it impossible and, and risky for anyone other than surveillance and safety and verification and monitoring providers to operate here in the UK. And the stories you all told about the, the personal skin you have in this game at, at the beginning of your talks makes me so sad. Because you think about how would you tell your stories? How would you get the support you need in, in a political context where you can't say the things you want to say, you can't talk to the people who you want to talk to, and the very thing you want to talk to has been deemed a harmful topic by a politician which is how it's going to work here, that one person, a political, non-elected non appointee, will have the power to define the constraints of free speech. And that is not how to make the UK the safest place in the world to be online, or how to mitigate online harms in any way. Yeah, wow. Thank you for that. That was a really powerful overview. The idea of, it, the, what would you say, it was like the slogan or like the tagline of being the you, the UK being the, the safest, the safest place, place in the world to be online. It, that just seems to me like a kind of ludicrous thing to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to try to even aim for. Um, and I really like your point about how when regulating with just big tech in mind, you, we essentially are uh, entrenching big tech as, as the sort of status quo. And it's really frustrating here. Um, we've seen a lot of um, politicians, you know, talk a really big game about cracking down on big tech and, you know, you know, standing up against, against these big bad companies, but then turning around and creating legislation that makes it fundamentally impossible for smaller tech companies to be able to, to be able to thrive and flourish and to be able to imagine a different kind of, um, uh, system or a different kind of structure that might actually go some way into in increasing um, online safety or, or, or at least decreasing harms. So that's, it's definitely something that we are seeing here as well. Um, I'm curious, I'd love to hear a little bit more. So age verification is, is a big issue around this, um, the issue of online safety. Uh, here, it's we're, we're pushing ahead with a roadmap for mandatory age verification for uh, pornography to begin with, but they are they're, they're not being at all, um, you know, coy about that being just the starting point. Um, I know that in the UK, so we here like saw the UK put this put age verification forward and then abandon it and then we were like oh we're gonna do it we're gonna do it anyway and now it sounds like it's you're you're doing it again I'd love to hear a little bit more from um, you Heather and and you Ruth about the age verification debate that's happening in the UK is there much resistance mm -hmm. to it um, and also yeah about that kind of flip-flop from from mm -hmm. abandoning it and then and then getting back onto that train well the really bizarre thing about the UK is that as, as the bill has been drafted, the age verification is not just for adult and pornographic content. It is for everything. Every Which website. Huge. That's huge. Everything. It's so, um, it's so I invasive. I explain it to people as cookie pop-ups for age verification. And Do again, that's the have... compliance. Sorry, go ahead. I'm, cu I'm curious if they have any kind of idea about how that will be implemented. Mm -hmm. Are they any kind of specifics about so, you know, facial recognition? Or... Yes, there's... Again, the UK has been quite enthusiastically supporting the age verification sector. Now, some of them are actual age verification, as in uh, use a credit card or a passport, and what happens if you can't access that, if you don't have either. And some are using things like what's called age assurance, which is, as you said, using facial verification 
by using the webcam to measure the, the shape of your head to determine if you're a child. Now, all of this is ostensibly to keep children safe. But as a mother of a teenager, that is not the world I want for her. I want her to explore and learn. And I want her to find things that challenge her. I do not want my child and the whole generation that comes after that growing up in some sort of government approved, safe, sanitary bubble where everything is awesome, nothing ever goes wrong, and anything that could conceivably upset a child uh, between the ages of zero and 18. Now, I'm sorry to use a very timely example, but what happened in Texas last week was very upsetting, and my teenager was extraordinarily upset about it. Now, what happens if a politician in Whitehall decides that is upsetting children and it's news, so we're just going to block it from anyone under the age of 18? Uh, likewise, the most heroic act of journalism on the planet in the past couple of years was a girl with an iPhone walking to the corner shop to get a snack, and she filmed the police kneeling on a man's neck. Um, and under the online safety bill, she wouldn't have even been able to upload that video because she was a child at the time and it depicted violent content. So in trying to make the UK a safe sanitary place for children, and that has anyone under the age of 18, um, by age verifying and age gating all of us, and by the way, mandating every service provider on the internet to become the holders of personally identifiable information about all of us and what we're looking at, is that going to stop any problem affecting a young person online that couldn't be addressed, for example, through the business models, the algorithm of promotion, the ad tech, as opposed to a, a, a sideways form of identity monitoring as a compliance obligation? Yeah, there's this real sense of um, safety by sanit safety, <laughs> I feel like it's important to put the air quotes around it, safety by sanitization rather than like any kind of more meaningful sense of um, like a broader sense of, of what safety would actually would actually mean. Um, keeping an eye on the time, we've got so much to talk about. Um, something else I wanted to bring up was encryption. So we haven't really spoken about this yet. End-to-end uh, -end encryption is often demonized as something that um, uh, enables all kinds of uh, harm online. Uh, the encryption debate in Australia is pretty awful, to put it bluntly. Um, our politicians are very critical of encryption and time and time again um, make attempts to undermine it. Um, we've passed legislation in, in the past, which is incredibly detrimental to uh, encryption. Um, I'm curious to hear from, from, from you all if you have any observations about end-to-end -end encryption in your respective areas. Maybe Dita, did you have anything you wanted? Ooh, I don't know if I, no, uh, Ruth? <laughs> I was just going to say one of the, um, so the online safety bill is a mammoth piece of legislation and we're seven years in. So what we've had is um, the current version of it um, now has enabling clauses for uh, to target end-to-end -end encryption, but they deleted the words end-to-end -end encryption. So we're in the worst of all worlds. So um, they could bring in uh, challenges to end-to-end -end encryption, but on the other hand, it's not named. So in terms of the political debate, that makes it really hard. What, what you're talking about is not in the legislation, except it is. So we're in this really odd place. And also, and I say this from a political perspective, one of the things that's really odd that's happening in the UK that I have never heard of before um, in our political context is um, the Home Office, which would be the department that is most concerned about, uh, that, that would um, manage the specific bit has instructed an ad agency to run a national ad campaign attacking end-to-end -end encryption. So trying to shape the public discourse to fix a problem that the public don't think is a problem yet. We've never done it that way round before in the UK. Government money has never been spent in my experience that way round. It's always, you know, government's meant to respond, not shape. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds are being spent by instructing someone. So, um, end-to-end encryption is definitely going to become an issue because the government now wants it to be an issue. From 
our perspective, I don't think I, to this audience, I need to tell everyone why it's so important for us, but from my perspective, I speak to someone weekly who's in Hong Kong. If anyone knew I was speaking to, you know, if anyone in Hong Kong knew I was speaking to them weekly, I probably wouldn't be able to get hold of them anymore. And I think that, you know, that it's all very well and good um, and it will be the unintended consequences. Everything in the youth UK is through the prism of protecting children. That is where the debate is, is not stuck, but that is where the debate is um, being held. But when you think about this in the wider context and the un unintended consequences of it and how everyone uses end-to-end -end encryption, I mean, people send baby photos. Our finances are now governed by end-to-end -end encryption. Every part of our lives are now governed by it. And it is very much, and I say this in a, um, as someone who sat in the chamber, it's a tick box exercise to say that they're fixing everything so they can tell people they've fixed it. It's not actually going to fix it. This is a political solution, not an actual solution, um, which will backfire horribly, but they don't care yet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've got a question from um, the audience, which is from Corey. Uh, I suspect this online safety act isn't just legislation gone wrong. From your perspectives, is it merely good online safety ideas being disastrously legislated or is it a pretexted deliberate attack by states to take away our rights? Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit from just the Online Safety Act and sort of more broadly. Um, I'd love to hear from um, Eliza and Dita on this if you have a perspective. Sure. Um, I would say it's a very targeted approach, not just by state, but by a lot of um, usually not for profit uh, groups with not only financial skin in the game, but um, an ideological skin, I guess. Um, and I think a lot of it, um, looking at our counterparts in the United States who are currently fighting not only uh, severe levels of white supremacy, um, at, but body um, autonomy being taken away in every right, um, from abortion to gender affirming care. So I would say that it's a very targeted effort and I would say with particularly end-to-end -end encryption, um, it's very, very specific because it allows people of marginalized groups to organize safely. Um, we, there is a war that has broken out in Ukraine where Instagram um, put out their end-to-end -end encryption over there. We need to also think about that um, as a perspective as not only just businesses, but activists and individuals. Yeah, what I would add as well for anyone who isn't aware, Australia doesn't have a, a charter of human rights or any sort of federally enshrined human rights. Um, so that is deeply, deeply challenging for us here um, when, when trying to push to, to fight for human rights because we don't have <laughs> much to point to. So it's really, really challenging. Um, Dita, did you have a perspective on, on this? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I don't know, because I come from Indonesia and it's, it's quite, um, it has been an, an, you know, not so free country, you know? And of course I have always have these suspicions, but, but I think it's not just Indonesia. But I'm speaking from, um, you know, um, my perspective as, as Indonesians is that, yeah, I think the government is deliberately to take away our freedoms or, or rights, right? And by doing, you know, you know, like heavily controlling the rights of people to, to, to express themselves to, or to, to um, you know, have opinions. Um, and it is, I mean, we can look at it, you know, not just from, what they do in digital spaces. This is this always have been what they do, even the you know in the physical spaces too, right? All of the regulations, all of the the laws that they do, is not really addressing the problems of the citizens, but it's always as you know it doesn't matter how shiny the laws looks, but it's always there is a, a you know um, um, an impact that that curtails um our freedom and and also our rights i just also want to um do want a quick comment on encryption 
it's likely that it's encryption uh, end to end encryption hasn't been the topic here in indonesia but the anonymity is now being a, a big debate also in indonesia um because you know like in on one hand that we as an activist especially women you know we need that uh, an anonymity but on the other hand at uh, that anonymity always been used by the law enforcement not to do anything when women or activists file a complaint uh, when they receive or explain di digital attacks online you know like when we complained you know if we experience ogbv online and we went we go to the uh, police uh, to the police and the police oh we cannot do anything because they're anonymous so i think that is also um a way for them to start talking about you know uh prohibiting um you know anonymity in indonesia it's just one of the tactics that they the use widely right now in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. the The debate about anonymity is also really heated here in Australia, especially the last week. It has really taken off um, because Twitter was ordered to um, uh, reveal some identifying information about an anonymous accounts. So it really sparked ideas about the merit of online anonymity, especially within the context of online safety and abuse and defamation. And there's this really pervasive assumption that gets pushed here by um, politicians that anonymity like by default is the like is the cause for abuse and for harm and so therefore if we remove anonymity everyone will be nicer to each other which is a fundamentally flawed position to take um but it's yeah it's not feel... true either like, <laughs> yeah, well, so well, exactly it's abused me are more than happy for me to know who they are exactly anyone who's been on facebook knows that the you know the real names policy does not make people nice to each other um i'm aware that we've only got eight minutes left and i would love to there's so much that we could talk about um and i wish we had more time but i would love to leave us on maybe a slightly more positive note if that's at all possible. Um, what I'm picking up on is that there is that very, very much a trend coming through that online safety as currently um, conceptualized is, is based on surveillance, monitoring and control, um, which as we have spoken about, does not actually lead to making people safer, especially marginalized um, or oppressed or, or otherwise, um, you know, communities who are, who are not, the dominant the dominant communities so this is an issue and I think that there's a real need for um sort of like a reclamation of online safety and what online safety could mean in a more meaningful sense so I would love to quickly just hear from each of you um either if you have any wins or lessons that you want to share and if not um or if you'd prefer to share with us instead your sort of vision of what online safety could mean if if we were able to um you know, tip it in the direction we'd like to go in. So maybe let's start with uh, Ruth. I think there is something that, you know, from our perspective, um, it's setting the tone of the debate. At the moment, we are very defensive and reactive, and we're not saying that there, because there are problems. Like, I think we need to start by accepting that our online safe can be really unpleasant. And we need to explain why it's so complicated to change it and actually what solutions could look like. And I, and I think that's where we're missing in the conversation at the moment. There's also an issue, and I say this with complete respect, but most of the people that are legislating in every parliament are of an age where social media is not something they understand. And that's me being very polite. So they've only heard of Facebook or of Twitter, and it's they've had really unfortunate personal experiences on both of those platforms. So I think what we've got to do is talk about the sector in the round, the fact that actually, especially post-COVID, the fact that we're doing this over Zoom, like our whole lives have changed and are now online. And this whole debate is about what happened five years ago, not what's going to happen in five years' time. And it's how we talk about and you know, for slightly different in Australia at the moment, but you know, that politically, where the, um, there is a right wing nexus that is looking at some of these issues. So looking at it as a commercial element of the economic impact of what they're trying to achieve. I think we've got to talk, you know, I, I am a true believer of when you're campaigning, which we are on these issues, 
you talk to you talk to people about the issues that they care about not the ones that we wish they cared about so we've got to find those sweet spots to take the politicians on a journey with us and that that, that includes acknowledging there's a problem and it also says look you know i had horrible experiences again in february online this year and after I got through the horror, I realised that what I that I hadn't um, changed my settings. I hadn't updated my settings again. Like I, of all people, hadn't protected myself online. And I think that, that yeah, there is an education, culture, softer element to this that we need to talk about too. Brilliant, uh, Eliza. Do you want to share? I am usually known as the doom bringer amongst most of my circles, so I'm going to actually try really hard to say something positive for once. Um, online safety is not just about a small segment of the community. Um, if we are just making the uh, online space safe for children, we're making it unsafe for adults. Um, the best thing to have come out of the Online Safety Act in Australia is communities understanding that it won't keep them safe and it is making them ask questions of their politicians and getting involved and trying to learn more about the internet and how it works and how they should be involved with their children and also how they should broach those hard conversations of what happens when you see harmful content um, or what's interpreted as harmful content to your um, your situation, your culture. Um, so I think moving forward, um, exactly as Ruth said, it's about engaging people on the matters that are important to them. Um, ultimately, I would like to hope that people understand it's not <sighs> porn and pornography, sex, and sex workers, the adult industry actually does really care about youth and wants to protect it. Um, we were all young people and a lot of us have kids, a lot of us have nephews, uh, kids, nibblings, everything. Um, it's about their safety um, and doing this doesn't keep them safe. It makes them sanitized um, and unable to deal with the realities of not just the online world, but the offline world. Yeah. Okay. Three minutes. It's a challenge. Uh, Heather, do you want to go next? <laughs> In 60 seconds. Um, it is impossible <laughs> for any group, whether that's a tech organization or a civil society group, to work with any government in good faith, which is acting in bad faith. And in, the, in our political context, for the three of us, that means, as I said at the beginning, politicized and political legislation. I, you know, we have a, a Secretary of State for Digital who will be in charge of defining what is acceptable speech online, who went on live TV the other day and said that something that we all witnessed happened on live TV did not happen. No, 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 you misunderstood. You were wrong. Um, and anything that any of us in our, our advocacy work, our professional work can do in good faith is not going to make a, a bit of difference if we're having to deal with politicians who rewrite the rules as they go, as our government does, as yours certainly do, depending on what political outcome they want for themselves at the end of the day. If these governments want to be taken seriously, they're going to need to step back from their own creation and work at it in good faith rather than bad. And until that happens, it's almost not even worth our time engaging on many levels of this. As it's all I said we were ending on a positive games. note. I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dita, you've got last final minute. Yes, um, thank you. I think we need to understand that safety means different things and how we want that safety to happen would mean different things and that should be accommodated. But yeah, so I agree that the next step is that we need to be in the conversation because it, what's lacking from the conversation is us. We need to be in the table with those in power to decide uh, what kind of technology or digital spaces that we want. Unless we are in that table, we cannot change the table. So we need to be in the table. And especially if they're acting in bad faith, as, as Heather said, especially then. Okay, well, we're at time. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming and for the wonderful speakers thank you. for sharing your insights.